Hey friends, your pal Mike Shea from Sly Flourish here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy GM Prep. In this weekly show, I go through steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my Sunday D&D game. In this case, I am running the adventure Scarlet Citadel by Kobold Press. This show, like all of the work of Sly Flourish, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. You too can become a patron. The link is in the show notes below. Patrons get access to all kinds of exclusive adventures, exclusive tips and tricks for helping run your D&D game, previews of upcoming videos, access to a dedicated Discord channel, channel access to the monthly patreon q a but most of all they help me put on shows like this to the patrons of sly flourish thank you so much for your support i realize that i had not done my proper homework for running scarlet citadel which is something that i have uh, not solved completely but i have done a lot better work over this past week it is with great shame that I admit, I don't think I've actually read this adventure. <laughs> I thought I had. I thought like, oh yeah, no, I've read Scarlet Citadel. I know what's happening. I know what's going on. And I think I read the introduction and I think I started reading it and then I kind of skimmed a little bit, but I didn't really know all of the things that are going on in this adventure. And it kind of came out, I felt uncomfortable with how my session went last week. It was, I think it was fine, but there were parts of it where I was like, I don't know, I, it felt kind of off. Like the players are really enjoying their characters. There's a lot of depth of the characters. We did some fun exploration. There was definitely like a, they picked up a great big horde and there was like 1800 copper pieces in it. And they're like, oh, well, we're just going to convert that to gold. And I'm like, is there an ATM here in Scarlet Citadel? I don't think so. You have 1,800 copper you're going to have to carry around, and you can't carry 1,800 copper pieces. That's a lot. Like, that's a lot of that's a lot to carry around so they're like well, okay we'll skip the copper and just grab the silver and gold and i was like all right that's fair but i was like i'm you know we want to get a little bit more old school here with our campaign a little bit more like you can't just kind of grab and convert everything and you know and there's some short hands that you can do like if you're in, have cities nearby that you can't do when you're delving deep into a dungeon like this but i realized like after the game i was like i don't know if this is gelling quite right and i don't know why it's not gelling quite right and i think part of the reason is like i don't really know where this thing is going i don't know what's happening exactly i don't know what the overall plan is and i'm like and i'm you know i'm like i'm going to just sit and spend some time so i grabbed the hardcover book i went out to my park near my house and i sat down and just read the read a good chunk of the first couple of chapters of it and i was like i don't think i've read this and then i've read chapter three and four i read the intros to chapter three and four i think the good news is you, you don't really have to read the whole book to get a good feeling for what's happening and then as you get closer to running those sections you might want to dive deep into those sections because each of the levels sort of has its own story. And that's something now I figured out. And I'm glad I did because level two has some crazy stuff going on. We're going to talk about the crazy stuff going on in level two of Scarlet Citadel. In short, it's not far off from the kooky Numenera game I just ran. So we're going to talk about that because there's some crazy things that happen in chapter two. But mostly we're going to get ready to prepare for the remainder of chapter one. But now I feel like I've digested fully chapter one. I've digested fully chapter two. And I've read the introduction to chapter three and the intro to chapter four without reading every room description. And I want to read through all the room, all the chapter headings so I understand how that works. And then read, and then as I get closer, I want to read at least one level ahead. As I often do, I am using Notion to do my campaign planning and prep today. If you want to learn how to use Notion to do lazy DM prep, there's links to the article about how to use Notion for campaign prep, and there's links to this uh, this specific Notion template so you can see like hey these are the notes that we have you can you can see all of that patrons get access to all of them if you want to be a patron patron of Flourish, you get access to all of the notebooks that i have for all of the different campaigns i'm running including ones that i don't record on like empire of the ghouls so that's that's pretty handy in the last session they had just gotten beat up really badly by an owlbear i was reminded by people helpful people on youtube that the owlbear isn't necessarily supposed to show up when it showed up but i didn't care i thought the owlbear made sense and it was really hard, but they were already second level at that point. So it wasn't like they were completely out of hand, but they did get beat up bad by that owlbear. So they they licked their wounds from the from getting beat up by the owlbear. They found the owlbear's horde and they I think they picked up a piece of loot. I'm, I'm So you got to work with me a little bit. Oh, they, they got this spear and somebody recommended a spear in the last session. And it turned out the spear wasn't the best item because none of the strength people really want to use a spear. They like their great big weapons and it's not a finesse weapon, which means nobody with dexterity. I think almost all the characters are dex based. So they have this spear, this glowing rune plus one spear of Velus the Great Serpent. But I think like a bard ended up taking it. I don't remember who actually took it and it casts Thunder Wave and that's cool. So they not have a nice magical weapon, but it's not like a magic weapon that somebody's going to be using all the time. It's sort of like, oh yeah, no, I carry a spear. 
but they they got that they got all of the the, the 1800 copper pieces and all that so they they managed to loot it and then they ran into Tisha the halfling and Letitia told them that she had some friends who had been captured down there and were captured by the jailer and she did a lot of like foreshadowing of the jailer is a really nasty dude watch out for the jailer because he's a terrible guy he kidnaps people from the town he's torturing them down there he's doing very terrible things and he's you know partnered with this guy named Scar, this big ogre that supports the jailer. So that all that all came out in their in their talk with Letitia, and they said, well, let's go on down. And so they went down into the first area down in the lower right. You can see the map, and where is the stairs? So they come in from the lower right portion of that map. I don't really have a good way to highlight it here. I guess I can zoom in. So they came in here. They got hit by the very first tr- that they that they hit, and then they. They peered through the door to the north and saw that there's a bunch of cells there. And then they went to the right. And the scouting, this this is kind of funny because they the group needs to kind of figure out its plan. And they haven't yet figured it out. And I don't know how much... I'm not pushing them too heavily into like make a plan. I kind of want them to learn how to make a plan. Again, one thing that to kind of recall, and I, I might need to reinforce this with my players, is that this adventure, Scarlet Citadel, was written by Steve Winter. Steve Winter has been writing D&D stuff professionally for I think close to 40 years. He was there when they were converting first edition to second edition. He was working for TSR. He, he works for TSR. He now does a lot of work for Cobalt Press. I don't know if he's an employee of Cobalt Press or if he's a contractor for Cobalt Press, but he's done a lot of work. He does a lot of editing for Cobalt Press. And he wrote Scarlet Citadel, and he definitely wrote it. And when you read the introduction to the adventure and you read the style, which is important to do, it's definitely built to be an old school dungeon crawl kind of thing. There's a lot of description in it about how to handle things like perception checks and how to handle the, you know, how, right, like look at this, sound, light, traps and secret doors. And the writing of this is very much like do not coddle the players. You do not do, and you know, you, you do not just make them, they, they can't roll the same check over and over again. If they fail a check, it's failed. And they, you know, the next person in line can't just roll and try to do it themselves. You know, my style is definitely sort of a happier, huggier style uh, recognizing that like the players don't really understand the situation that's going on in the game. And I believe in these things, right? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think this is important that the characters know more than the players do. The characters are there, live in this thing. The players are like players. The players are adventurers for three hours a week. The adventurers are adventurers their whole lives. I, I want to make sure that I'm, we're being clear about things. I don't want mistakes to happen because the char- the player didn't understand something their character would have understood. So I definitely play in on this be, be nicer sort of idea. And that means it's going to be a little bit trickier for me to run this adventure because some of it, some of the adventure is definitely like gotcha, gotcha sort of moments. And as long as like those gotcha moments are in good faith, then I'm totally happy with them. If the gotcha moments are like a downer and they're just not, they're not that exciting. They're not that fun. Oh, you stepped in a trap, got shot in the eye with a poison dart. That That's not the kind of D&D I'm super excited about. Th- figuring that out is is going to be tricky. And they're, I'm reading in the future, in future uh, chapters, there are descriptions of like how you don't want to be nice to the players in this. You don't want to set up encounters that are designed for the, the players to be able to survive. You want to show them that they are, they could be in a situation that is overwhelming. There's a few where they a few sections where they talk about this they're going to get overwhelmed they shouldn't be able to just you know carve their way and then take a long rest right here in the place you know so it's a lot of things to keep in mind and it's it's definitely a balance of style i don't i'm not against it like i'm not like oh this is not the kind of adventure i want to run it is the kind of adventure i want to run but it's different than the kind of style i have when i run it and that's going to be a balance for me that's going to be a trick and i think some of that came out in in this first in our kind of the first time they actually delved down into into scarlet citadel itself into level one so they when they were exploring the upper part of level zero they they found the treasure of the owl bear which i think i kind of added i don't think there was really a lot of treasure in the book and then they explored this upper area i I, they didn't get attacked by anything they found the harpy nest they were worried about traps and they were definitely worried about what was going on exploring was definitely interesting then they went down into that lower hold and that's where they found the the picture and i showed them the picture of the door right there so they saw they saw that picture which is funny because i'm pretty sure this art doesn't match what actually is there because they're like what's up with the windows and curtains (laughs) <laughs> right one of the players is like why are there windows and curtains in this picture and i'm like yeah that's a really good point like there's no reason like look how ornate that is and there's like paintings on the walls and like this place got burned down 
right? It got burned down. So I think there was an art order mismatch. I, I have a feeling in this in this particular piece of art in the description that this is what they see when they go down and they're like, this is a part of a manor that's fine. Like, you know, look at it. It's, that looks beautiful. It doesn't look like a place where the roof collapsed and it's been rained on for, you know, three centuries. So, yeah, I thought I thought that was kind of funny. And, and, and I was like, well, I'll just crop it. So when I cropped the picture, I tried to crop the windows out. And still they're like, are there windows? And I was like, no, <laughs> yeah, no, there's no windows. So that was a little funny. So they went down into the first level. They immediately got shot in the face with a dart trap right right off the bat. Right. As soon as they went down there, the perception check, the person who went down did not have does not have a passive perception check that's higher than 13. So they didn't they didn't notice that. And they immediately got you know, they stepped on it and they got shot. And I think a bunch of people had to make this dex check. The first, I had like the first two rows of people had to make the dex check, but only one person failed it and they just got shot for five points of damage. Not a, not a terrible deal. And the, the funny thing is, so when they met with the Letitia up above, I had Letitia create the quest for them. I had Letitia make the quest for them. And, and I clarified like, your job is to slay the jailer, kill the jailer, and then you get third level. And I built that quest. And I think that that made sense. The, the, this adventure, I don't think is mile. It's not a milestone based adventure. It's not a, a they, they, everyone yells at me about milestone. Milestone does not mean what you think it means, Mike. It is not a level up by situation or level up you know, the, the circumstance, what they call it, like scene based leveling. There's another name for it. It's not milestone. The milestone leveling means that you give certain experience points, pig piles of experience points for certain things accomplished. But the other one is you give levels on certain things accomplished because I don't want to handle experience points. So trying to convert that is definitely different than this adventure is intended to be run. It's, invent, it's intended to be run with experience points. It is an old school adventure. It's run an old school way. But I'm still not doing it that way. And this might be a continual thing of like, oh, the adventure wants you to do it this way, but I don't want to do it that way. And then there's this clash. And that could be an issue while I'm running it. We'll, we'll, we'll find out as we go. I'm at least aware of this. So I said, instead, I'm going to tie levels to specific quests that they pick up that let them explore it. But the problem is sometimes they might not know about it. So in the case of the jailer, it was important that they learned about the jailer from an NPC so they could get the quest to go kill the jailer. Now, maybe they could. I could have done that back in Red Tower if I'd been thinking about it, but I wasn't thinking about it. So instead, Letitia gave him the quest to... to, to to handle the jailer and that they were like okay and they kind of laughed a little bit i remember when i said like you have now received a quest when you defeat the jailer you will get the third level and they're like ah, okay like that's pretty specific so they weren't used to like having a quest where the level and the quest are tied together but it means that there's now a milestone they know what it is and they know what they get when they get it i'm kind of following the matt colville idea of like you know clarify these quests for the players when they get them what they did is they went down the stairs they looked through the first thing they saw the cells there and then they started to make their way to the left and the person that they had who was doing the scouting has like a terrible passive perception they didn't see much of anything until like they started getting beat up by zombies that are hanging from big meat hooks and i showed a picture of that and it's very gory this first level is really really gory i don't think the future ones are quite as are quite as gory as this one is but this one's definitely like it's good for halloween it's kind of fun body horror thing for Halloween. Chains hanging, you know, bodies wriggling around on meat hooks, trying to slap you. That's definitely some some cool stuff. So they 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 I think they destroyed the zombies, but they blasted them with something. I don't think it was thunder wave, but they hit them with some big blast and destroyed the zombies. Zombies are all dead, hanging on the hooks. And then they went peering down the obliette or the oubliette, right? The down in the in the center of this thing is the oubliette. The Weird thing about the oubliette is I wasn't sure when they peered down, they sent a familiar down there. One of the characters has the ability to create familiars. She, she, that's her thing is creating these familiars. She kind of plucks a soul out of the world that she had come from, turns it into a manifested animal, and then the animal works for her. And she sent it down into the oubliette. And, and it can, it, I think the thing could fly or crawl or whatever, but it, it meant that they could go the full 200 feet down. And I was like, what would they see? So they, it, it describes here that if you drop a light, you will see that it, it expands out and then contracts back down on occasion. But it didn't say like it connects directly to areas X on level two, areas X on level three, and areas X on level. It does say that it ends up in the vampire bat cavern. So I was like, okay, well, I know it goes there. And then I had it go down there. And I said, like, it peers around and you see a great big, large cavern. And then all of a sudden you get attacked. You see, like, sharp teeth and red eyes. And then your familiar explodes. And she's like, whoa. And then I had two vampire bats come flying up the, 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 the shaft and attack them, the saber-toothed bats. And they fought the saber-toothed bats and killed them pretty quickly. So they're like, okay, well, let's go sneak around some more. 
and one of the characters made went out down this hall to the left and who's standing around the corner but the jailer and so the jailer slams the first person that comes around the corner with a big mallet we rolled for initiative and i think hit them really hard did not knock them out that was the same character who can summon familiars got hit with the mallet got you know kind of knock prone and then another character ran in to, to kind of steer the way and got hit with another mallet and dropped to zero right away so they have one character who's down to zero one who's like in the room trapped the jailer tried to immediately throw out some animated meat hooks to pull that person and drag them into the room and the other character was like oh my god and we that was where we ended the session so we ended the session with them in the fight with the jailer and all i could think of was like i gave you this quest for the jailer two hours ago and here he is like the time between getting the quest and meeting the boss of the quest was so short. It, it felt too short. So that was, that was one, I mean, it happened, so it is what it is. But it, but it, and it doesn't make, it, it still makes sense that the jailer is the boss of this level. It's just kind of interesting that the jailer is right there at the beginning of this level. So, yes, yeah, so that was interesting. We're going to make a new campaign session planning notes today. Today is 30 October. Sunday, Scarlet, Scarlet Citadel. The characters we have today, I don't know who's out today. I think we might have everybody. And boy, I tell you, when you have six characters, it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff. So you have Bart, Jay, played by Jay, a Gearforged Bard diplomat. So Bart, Jay had not been in the previous session, so he was discovered, dis kind of beat up in a pile, sort of like the Tin Man or C three PO in Empire in Empire Strikes Back where he was in pieces and they kind of put him back together. And I think he might have been excited to remain in pieces, but I was like, nah, we'll have you, you know, I don't want to disable your character. So you like, your characters get put back together. The other characters put it back together. And now he's like, oh yeah, I'll go with these characters and see what's going on. Because he's a gear forge, he also has this connection of he was a soul that is now in another body. And we have all of these like souls and other bodies is like the big shtick for this, for this, for this group. And something I definitely want to play with that overall theme of these 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 people who are all mingled with death or having died and come back or died and are in other bodies there's this this connection and then this other connection of randomness this connection to the weird weaver is the other sort of big theme for this group so bard is a gearforge bard diplomat doran graycastle is a shade who is in his soul was pulled out of the forgotten realms and dropped here into midgard into midgard so he doesn't know where he is garble is the mushroom folk rogue far traveler who is looking for a new home for his group malarkey jones is a tiefling warlock noble kind of Things have always gone very well for her, but she's also kind of following randomness, and now she's ended up down here. We'll see if things continue to go well for her. We have Mez Rumseleth, played by Sharon, is a frost elf fighter, Parfumier, parf parfum, who tries to help bring the dead, when, when people die, kind of bring them naturally into the afterlife, and is kind of upset that Dorn has taken over the bodies of one of the people she was supposed to bury and doesn't like it when Dorn, Dorn's body gets beat up because he's like, that was a person, you know, I'm supposed to bring him dead, aren't you sure? And Skrink Skip, played by Juliet, is a rat folk wizard occultist follower of the Weird Weaver who was sacrificed and then came back and recognizes that her goal is to return the Weird Weaver. The Weird Weaver is trapped and being used for terrible, the energy of the Weird Weaver is being used for terrible purposes down in Scarlet Citadel and is there to solve it. So those are our characters today. The strong start is easy because we're in the middle of a fight what could the the we could have i could be mean the animated hooks if we look at the adventure let's let's make sure that i've i've got this right before we just start making things up one thing i will say another i have, I have you know now it, it takes me some time to like recognize what an adventure has and what it doesn't this is definitely a wordy adventure. There is a lot of words. You can look at like how long the descriptions are for any given room. And the trick with this is like, this is not handy when I'm running it. And I do kind of wish, this is a good thought about like adventure design. If any adventure designers or, or one of, you know, would be adventure designers are out there that are kind of looking at this. One of the things to keep in mind is the usability of your product. Like how is it physically being used? And the idea of like having a bunch of front matter with the expectation that players are going to read it, or that your DM is going to read it out of the game is great. And then when you get to things in the game, make sure that like it's summarized in a way that I can skim it and pull what I need because I'm in the middle of a game. I don't have time to read a page. I think it's, you know, that's like a page of text for one room. 
right? Just, just the torture chamber. Like I, I need it summarized or I need like the, here's the summary of what's going on. And then here's the longer description that you may want to read when you're not running the game, because that's really tricky. And I have, I've had trouble with this. Like I miss stuff. I miss stuff anyway. I'm not, I'm not a careful reader with this kind of thing. So yeah, here is the, right. The, the oubliette, right. Is, is one thing. So then we have these animated torture items, but I think these are on the wrong page, right? I think they're, I think they describe them on a different page. The frog shrine. The jailer is in this room torturing the red heart. The red heart is the knight. They know about, the characters know about the knight. The torture devices in this room aren't simple machines. They're animated. The jailer can command any number of them to lurch into action as a bonus action. You choose which item, see the table, become active, and when, based on how dangerous you want this chamber to be. Adding just one or two devices to combat per round and stopping just before the situation gets out of hand is a good idea. So I like this. One, one thing I really dig about this is there are dials, right? That the number of those devices are a pure dial that I can use to ratchet up the danger, but also tone it down if things get completely out of hand. Adding one or two devices to the round, a good idea because this battle can get quickly overwhelmed with the characters. Otherwise, because the growing threat ramps up the player's fear, blah, blah, blah. Remember that the jailer is entirely insane and more interested in watching people suffer than winning or even surviving. All the devices are kind of 10, intelligent, blah, blah, blah. Those kind of mechanics. Their life isn't tied to the jailers. They keep fighting, even if he's killed, unless you decide otherwise. I don't know what good that would do. The original significance of the frog statue has been lost to ages. Kagoth Z believes the elf. Then it brings like Kagoth Z. This is another one. We're like, who the hell's that? And like, oh yeah, he's the dude in one level down, right? And luckily I read it, so now I know who Kagoth Z is. Spoilers. Kagoth Z is a mage who is really dorking around with time magic. And boy, when we get into what happens in level two with time magic, that's going to be a, that's going to be fun. I think it's cool, but it's also like, it's going to go in lots of weird directions. Reason of the run before humans took over the Citadel. In fact, the elves found it sunken in a mire when they arrived. They knew no more of its history than Calgo They installed in this chamber to honor its antiquity with the belief it somehow arose in the Black River far below. Even the elves around the statue is a relic of the void. It came to hear the far distant past when Midgard and the void overlapped. So that's kind of fun stuff. But again, like, it's so much text. Anyone who examines the statue closely, momentary vision of the void that leaves him stunned. Perfect opportunity for a lazy DM companion. What's it called? Stress effects. Instead of stunning people, give them a stress effect. Let them give them give them a funny thing that happens or an interesting thing that happens to them, and give them the option to break out of it using their psychic damage, particularly if they are using it. Or they, or you could just kind of hand wave the stun. So that's that's pretty much it. But I guess the main thing is like they're they're, they're in this torture chamber. This is the lower right. There's a frog god. They can figure that out later. There's all these torture implements. The jailer is in here. What I really want to do, and it, it's kind of, it's a little, you know, lame. I don't know. This that Maybe this isn't the best thing to do. What I'd like to do is I think it's Skrink. It's Skrink who got knocked down, but not is not unconscious. And I want to have... What I, what I want to do, which I think is a fun way to handle this, but I think it's going to, you know, I think there'll be some, wait a minute, that's some BS right there, is that the jailer animates a bunch of these hooks until one of them hits. And then when one hits, it will drag Skrink further into the room and the jailer will go deeper into the room. So the characters have to go, one of our, one of our characters is in there and is still alive we have to go in and save them it's not this like let's just regroup and run so I, you know i don't know i think it could be fun a big hook grabs skrink and drags her him him into the room where on the jailer puts him on a table and draws a big knife a big sacrificial knife so that changes things up. The other idea I had as, as again, sort of a, a dial, would she come from this direction? I suppose she might. Is there's another variable in this, in this level, which I think could be fun. And that is Lux. Ushalux the blood cultist, who we should put down in the NPCs. In fact, we're going to create a new NPC hates hates the jailer this is going to be a little dangerous D, &D cultist yeah she looks nice because i don't think there's a picture of her in the in the book i'm pretty sure that's right and she she certainly looks like a bug cultist that works so we have ushlux whoops 
Ushlux the bug cultist. So Ushlux does not like the jailer. Ushlux might be willing to aid the characters in their battle against the jailer. So an option is that one of the things is Ushlux might be willing to give the characters a couple of potions of greater healing if it steers the battle away from the jailer that's that's an option so that way they have because she she doesn't like the jailer one of the things in the in the and so who the hell is ushalux ushalux is another npc who's running a bunch of experiments in the uh, uh, shrine to Char- to Charon. she's uh, Charon the boatman Charon, Charon, somebody help me out and the idea in, in the book it's like well ushalux is just there to kill the characters uh, and she'll like set them up i think she's kind of this you know somewhat malevolent ally that she's not like i'm not going to help you guys live but like you know it might be kind of i don't like the jailer he's a pain in the ass and i don't want to face him myself because he's got friends but but she might she might be a kind of an interesting like i said a malevolent ally like she's not going to help them she's not going to tell them like oh yeah she, she might say like oh you definitely want to check out there's great treasure in the in the in the great treasure in the in the crypts to the west you definitely want to check that out and it's like no it's actually full of deadly undead but you know but she might also be like yeah but i really don't like i don't i really don't like the jailer so i'm gonna i'm gonna help there but how could that play out because the other idea i had was that it's not enough for the characters to just fight the jailer i think i'm also going to drop in the our, our our ogre friend who is scar is his name is that do i have that right i think his name is scar scar yeah scar the crimson ogre right i don't see an npc for scar oh no did i not name the database i have an ocean problem so campaign database this is a, here's a trick for you you always want to rename this to the name of your campaign that way when you the reason why is that way when you call upon it to make a new page if i'm for example going to make a new page for scar i can do new page in scarlet database and it should bring up the scarlet the scarlet citadel database scar the crimson tag him as npc i think i spelled misspelled his name i think it's yeah it's it's just a car crimson tusk ogre let's see if i can find an image for that that looks good. Oh, that's from my creature codex. Is he an ogre? Wow, the Crimson Tusk Ogre is crazy powerful. If Scar is a true Crimson Tusk Ogre, then he is like way, way too tough. Sorry, I pulled it up in a different window. But the Crimson Tusk Ogre is CR5, 93 hit points. It does And it's a, it's a Cobalt Press CR5, which means it's serious. And it does two attacks, one with its Morningstar, one with its Bite. The Morningstar is 13 damage with a Morningstar, and the Bite is 11. And it can do a Berserker Charge. I guess I could do that, but he could be, like, wounded. He could be a smaller one. I could just use the regular Ogre stat block, too. I think we'll just do that. Scar the Crimson Ogre. So where could Scar come from? My only thought is that Scar is going to come from the cells. He's going to hear the situation that's going on. And he's going to come through the cells to the right and cut off their escape. So they're going to have to do this. But then where, from where would Ushalex show up? Like how can she show up and help them out? So I think what could happen that might be interesting is Ushalex could like sit these two things on the ground and then churn and like dart away just as scar comes out and scar doesn't see her and she's sort of slinking around back there and then that's sort of the big battle that they're gonna have right is they're gonna they're gonna have to fight the jailer they're gonna have to fight scar and if they have six characters even in second level that's not too bad and they'll have these extra healing potions that could potentially help and then any other any other tricks that they've got is that am I, and then they, you've got the hooks too. Is this too hard? Should they have the opportunity to run? And and, and if they do have the opportunity to run, if they because I know that I've seen the players chatting in the Discord server between sessions, which is really nice. It's nice when your players care enough about the game that they're chatting about it in between sessions. And they're talking about maybe we should just flee. But if they flee, what's their plan to come back? And what changes down below? 
if they do. I mean, we could we could figure that out. But I also wonder, like, it, you know, it seems like kind of a drag if they flee and then they come back and it's like, well, we're back in the same scene again. You know, there's no other way for them to get down there. Certainly, s- certainly the jailer and Scar could set up other traps and things like that and saying like, oh, we now know that there's a group that th- out there. He might send Scar and some other hired mercenaries to try to go capture the characters and bring them back or kill them on the spot. That's an option. But then the other one is like, do you know, is it better if they just if, if the scene plays out and if they kill, you know, we, we set it up and it's really hard, but they do manage to defeat with 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 sort of added things. They do manage to defeat the jailer. Is that is that kind of better? I think it probably is better for the like if the overall theme of the game is that it's it's better. I think that might be it. So I guess I can see how it goes. Like, I don't have to do all of this right away. I can kind of, ha- I have these options now. I have the option that Ushalex could be lurking around down there, ready to drop healing potions on the players to help them out. I also have the option that Scar is lurking around trying to figure out what's going on. And, you know, I have the other dials of like, how hard is it that, that you know, how hard is it that, how hard is it to escape? And how hard is the jailer? So I have a lot of, a lot of different options here. So we'll set that part of it aside and we will, we will see where that goes, but let's dive into some of the rest of our prep for today. So we'll, we'll figure out that situation, but then let's go a little bit deeper. So the, the Western side of the first level, the Western side of the yeah, first level of Scarlet Citadel is made up of the crypts of the Holzanger family. I can never spell the Holzanger. I guess it's spelled like it's pronounced. Of the Holzanger family. There is a terrible and dark energy awakening the dead in the crypts. A portal to the Dustlands has been opened underneath the crypts. As long as it is open, horrible undead from the Dustlands will continue to arrive. We had, I think we had some secrets last time about the Dustlands because we went and looked it up. The Drylands, not the Dustlands, the Drylands. These are all good. These are a bunch of secrets. Others have been captured in the jail. Yeah, so we had that. But these four secrets, I know I say rewrite your secrets, but these four secrets are really good. And I'm just going to grab them and go. And we can kill us. Not the Dustlands, the Drylands. Holzanger Catacombs are rife. Rife with undead, thanks to a weak spot in the dimensional barrier. That works. I think, so let's, let's look. When I read that section, the actual, like the way to close down the thing. So that's section six, 117, 113 through 117. The, like how they, how you can close this down. I, I can't remember if there's a way to shut down this this portal to the, the, the to the to the dry lands and see like it talks about how you got tons of stuff and this is what i mean about like the, the you know don't let the party simply walk out unhurried make them run for their lives if you're a gm who doesn't mind killing characters it's an excellent place to do it a character killed by a shadow a white or a wraith can return as undead to bedevil as far that's what i mean about like an opinionated adventure like this one does not you know if you're looking for hardcore adventures where characters die this is it but go find out if that's what your players want Good aligned characters ought to feel compelled to seal off this portal because of the threat it poses, but it's not as simple as defacing a few glyphs or casting dispel magic. Clues and tools needed to close this path can all be found deeper in the dungeon. See, where? It could be nice if it, you know, mentions where. I have to go find out. Nothing here spells out... Nothing here spells that out. Evil doesn't leave a step-by-step instructions. If the characters search the catacombs completely while fending off unending attacks from undead the players still don't realize they can't solve this problem easily and instantly you may need to allow an insight investigation or arcana check to give someone a flash of understanding this is a longer term story element this is where i'm like well, just tell them but you know it's up to you know kind of up to how you want to run it but boy it'd be nice if it said like well where like how come there's not an index here there's, you know see chapter four section 30 for the thing that that does it so the portal the key uh, the closing the portal requires more than just traditional magic or arcane manipulation. So now I gotta go dig through. I guess we can find out. Let's do a search for dry lands. And let's see. 
presence of the chain this is all the way at the bottom spoilers for the end of this thing presence of the chain thing nearly atop the black river is also what's keeping the portal of dry lands open at level two when the chain thing is destroyed the portal closes permanently undead on this side are trapped so this is important right and it could mention that that the feeling is there is a that this thing down deep here is what you know a darkness deep below is responsible for the open wound leading to the dry lands that's something that a good arcana check would find out so so that's that's important then we have let's we have some information let's go back, go back up the top now kill our dry lands thing so i'm glad search worked but boy wouldn't it be nice if that was indexed that's what i mean so i'm not fashion i'm still enjoying this adventure i still like it but when i talk about like adventures that you know help me out little things like that can help out a lot little things like check out chapter five section x that would be that would be really handy so i want to have i need some lore about our other friend our new npc ushalex so what is she doing ushalex of blood cultist venerates charon in the domain of death so that is a thing. Put that in there. And I think, Charon, let's bring up our Midgard World book. The more I read the Midgard World book, the more I think like it is the awesome critical book for Kobold Press stuff. Like you really want the best. I mean, the, the monster books are fantastic. The Midgard World book is so good. I really like it. C-H-A-R-U-N. Let's try that. Masks are kind of interesting. Karun, god of death, master of the rivers, Styx and Leth, guardian of souls, watcher at the door, patron of sailors and grave diggers. That's fun. Karun is the god of death, master of the river, Styx and Leth, guardian of souls, watcher at the door, patron of sailors and grave diggers. MWB page 385, write your page numbers down. Oversees the passage of souls. So this whole section here is like full of secrets. Protects traveler, planar travels, especially mortals from demons and celestials alike. This is all good stuff. We're dropping right into the secrets. Useful lore about Charon is a good secret. Uh, and there is a Karun. Which looks a blood cult of Venerix Charon. She perceives the river as a, a metaphor for blood flowing through the arteries and believes Charon to, is connected to the drylands because of the proximity of this shrine to the crypt. And his connection to the drylands. This philosophy is both heretical, both in mainstream views of Charon and in most blood cults, which is why Ushalek skulks here beneath Scarlet Citadel. Good, good, good stuff here. Drop that into a secret. A little bit of a long secret. That's actually probably a couple secrets. So we'll break that up in a couple. A statue is created and placed here by elves before the coming of the Holzangers. Two magical properties. One was instilled centuries ago by the elves, the other by Kagoth Z and Ushalex working together. So she knows about Kagoth Z. That's important because that means we have to put in secrets about him in here. Another powerful wizard resides in the chambers below the dungeon named Kagoth Z. Make sure I get the spelling right. I'm pretty sure I did. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. Whoops. We have a new NPC card for Kagoth Z. Kagoth Z is a secret, a powerful wizard, but, but completely obsessed with, the, with acquiring knowledge of the elves who used to be here. The elves managed to hide their lore, not in a place, but in a time. And that steered Kagoth into the twisted practice of time magic. It's amazing. It's, a, it's yeah, he hasn't torn himself into pieces spread over thousands of years practicing this type of heretical magic that's cool i got lots of secrets all right we're good on secrets i think that's plenty of information for them to learn so 
I don't need to worry about locations. Like locations are pretty solid, right? We don't have any no no real no real issues on locations. So I'm gonna I'm gonna dump that section. NPCs, I've got plenty of NPCs. Monsters, I've got, there's really not a lot, and they're all pretty standard, so I don't really have to keep track of monsters. I will do the Deadly Encounter benchmark threshold, just so I know. Six level two character divided by four is three. I think that's right, right? Six times two divided by four is three. So the Deadly Encounter benchmark is three, and they are facing more than three, so I know it's pretty deadly. One thing about the Deadly Encounter benchmark, so what, what kind of crazy math was that, Mike? The way to in, figure out if an encounter is potentially deadly, one of, the, one of the calculations I use, which I call the Deadly Encounter benchmark or the Lazy Encounter benchmark, depending on how you want to do it, and it's available on SlyFlare, it's right on the front page, is I look, I, I like to keep track of whether or not a, a battle could potentially be deadly. And a, a quick rule of thumb, rather than going through an encounter builder or using some kind of tool, is... A, a quick rule of thumb is an encounter may be deadly if the sum total of monster challenge ratings is greater than one fourth of the sum total of character levels. So you add all your character levels together, you divide them by four, and that gives you the benchmark. And that tells you if you add all of the monster CRs together and it's greater than that benchmark, you're in a potentially deadly situation. The lower level the characters, the more likely it is going to be deadly. The higher it gets, the less, the, the more swingy it can be. That changes to half of character levels when they reach fifth level. At fifth level and above, it's half of characters. If you get into like 11th level and above, it could be three fourths of their level. And at, at, at 17th level and above, it's probably equal to. It, the total number of challenge rating is equal to the total number of character levels. That's a deadly encounter, but that's also zany when you look at it. But I think that's about right. So what I what I do like to do is I just I just write that number down so I have it in mind. And for me, if I have six fourth, six second level characters, Characters, and I add that together, that's 12, and I divide it by 4, that is 3. So that's how I got to 3. So that means if there's more than 3 total challenge ratings of monsters, it is potentially deadly. And in this case, I already know it's going to be more than that. Because it's the Jailer, the Jailer's crazy meat hooks, and the, scar the, 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 the Crimson Ogre. Treasure, I'm going to also depend on what's in the book. Worst case, I can roll, I can roll my own treasure. But I think, I don't think, I mean, I wouldn't mind giving the characters another weapon that they can use let's let's take a look at the characters real quick this is important so we have a gear forged bard we have a a, 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 a dorn gray castle is a shade fighter what does he fight with let's take a look he has his character sheet in here he fights with right now he fights with a pair of short swords so a short a, a magical short sword wouldn't be good i'm gonna give a sneak preview of something that i've been working on i've been working on this pretty hard over the weekend i flashed it up a couple times if you missed it and that's Sly Flourish's random generators. This is a new tool. This is going to be available to patrons of Sly Flourish. I think it's already available to patrons on the Discord server, but I'm going to add it to the Patreon reward page today. So patrons will get access to this random generator. This is a whole bunch of different per chance generators that I created mashed into one tool so that you can design all kinds of things. And here's, here's how it gets really interesting. I want to create an uncommon magic item. I want it to be from... Midgard. I want to tie a deep magic spell to it. Randomize. I have a defiled gnomish plus one halberd of A10, the southern, the southern sun god. Titanic astral suit of splint armor of Perun, the crossroad god of war and thunder. A ruined ethereal helm of telepathy by Baco, the elven god of poetry. That's kind of interesting. See, I like that one. That's a cool one. We're going to grab that. We're going to drop that in. That might be good for the bard. So in this case, like I know it, I probably want to do a... A plus one weapon. Spite, what's spiteful weapon? That looks cool. Let's bring up my deep magic book. What am I doing? That looks fun. Spiteful weapon, third level necromancy spell. You create a connection between the target of the spell and an attacker that injured the target during the last 24 hours. And the melee weapon that caused the injury, all of which must be within range of the spell's cast. For the duration of the spell, whenever the attacker takes damage while holding the weapon... The target must make a charisma saving throw. On a failed save, the target takes the same amount of type of damage or half as much damage on a successful one. The attacker can use the weapon on itself and thus cause the target to take identical damage. A self-inflicted wound hits automatically, but the damage is still rolled randomly. That's pretty interesting. It takes an action. It lasts up to five rounds. So you would say like up to a minute. But this is kind of an interesting idea. Like what if you had this sort of the, the weapon of 
Oh, what if it was hers? She had a sword. So we could make a plus one short sword of Charon. And let's go back to the generator there. Ruined Ethereal, Titanic, Astral, Defiled Gnomish. That's not bad. Defiled Gnomish. Defiled Gnomish plus one sword of Charon. I don't know. I'll have to think about this. And I've already burned it out. A defiled no much plus one short sword of Charon that in f the cast of I, mean, I don't the idea that like you can wound yourself and do damage to the target it's kind of neat that once per day you can target a creature you have already done damage to and for one minute any damage you inflict to yourself also damages your target probably has a saving throw right does the does the actual one have a saving throw you create a you create a connection between the target of the spell it doesn't say whenever the target whenever the attacker takes damage while holding the weapon the target must make a, DC, a charisma saving throw and fail to the target takes the same amount of damage oh that's interesting i guess we'll just do spiteful weapon we're just going to say it can cast spiteful weapon it's a third level spell but it, it, it seems really weird so i don't think that that's a total problem that casts that casts spiteful weapon once per day. Is it of Charon? It's a I think it's like a, a you know maybe it's of Charon. I don't know. And what is a what will be the the blood burn? I think sounds like a cool a cool name for that weapon. That's good. I think we're good. I think we got everything we need. I've got lots of secrets and clues. I got lots of things going on. I still don't know. We're, we're gonna find out. We're gonna. I'm gonna play it out, play it by ear, and see how things go in the beginning of this blood boil. Blood boil is cool. Blood blood burn sounds better. I don't know. Blood burn. We're gonna see how it goes. I want to thank you, my friends, for hanging out with me today while I prepared for my Scarlet Citadel game. If you enjoyed this show, you can help me out by subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter where you get weekly D&D articles sent right to your inbox along with a free adventure generator PDF. You can support me directly on Patreon. You get access to all kinds of tips, tricks, tools, adventures, city source books, all kinds of stuff. Dedicated Discord channel, Patreon Q&A, all kinds of stuff you get for supporting Sly Flourish on Patreon. You can pick up any of my books in the Sly Flourish bookstore. All of the links for all three of those are in the show notes below. Thank you very much. Have a great day and get out there and play some D&D.